Okay. So the next thing is going to be treatment of chronic venous disease, and in particular, iliac venous disease. So how many of you guys are doing superficial vein treatments in your office or clinics with your faculty? Yeah. So it's interesting. Everybody goes into vascular surgery, I think, for arterial disease because it's the sexy part of vascular surgery. And then the reality is everybody will treat venous disease because, quite honestly, venous disease is very, very prevalent. It's, you can do it as an outpatient office procedure, for the most part, for treatment of superficial venous disease. And so my practice is both arterial and venous, but as I had more superficial vein patients, I started looking at some of those patients and realizing that there was untreated disease. So we'll talk a little bit about chronic venous disease. Um, Non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, or NIVL, are lesions like May Turner, but in addition to that, there are a couple other points of compression. So just to kind of review that, you can have compression um, of the left iliac vein, classic May Turner, beneath the right iliac artery, right? So everybody knows what May Turner is. But you can also get sometimes compression of the proximal right common iliac vein underneath the uh, right common iliac artery, just depending on the anatomy. And then you can certainly, at both of the hypogastrics, that can be a point of fixation. So I would say that there are different areas where you can get areas of narrowing of the vein. And truthfully, if you look at all comers, there's probably lots of people who have narrowing of the vein. So it's not even that they have narrowing of the vein, it's that they have narrowing of the vein in the face of uh, clinical symptoms, right? Because everything is really about the symptoms. Uh, let's see if that's going to work. So uh, really the gold standard, and this is just, I don't have any video clips, but the gold standard for treatment of iliac venous disease or suspicion of iliac venous disease is IVIS. And so these are just a couple of pictures of IVIS patients um, that are from the company, not my pictures, where you have left common iliac vein that looks relatively narrow, then you see it's contracted and irregular from previous thrombus, and then you see this kind of hyperechoic scar, which doesn't really look like a normal vein. Same thing, here's a left iliac vein, normal, you see it contracted, and then you see hyperechoic scar. You know, I will tell you that um, I think IVIS is really the gold standard. You can get CTs. CTs can be really misleading. If you get a CT that's stone cold normal, yeah, you probably don't have to do anything. Sometimes you can see that on CT. Almost always my patients will want a CT, and they never do the study correctly. They never do a CT venogram, no matter how many times I write it on the paper and jump up and down and call the radiologist. The tech tech at 9 o'clock at night is just processing through. So you rarely get the contrast exposure correctly, but a lot of times you can infer what the vessel is, even if the contrast exposure is not quite correct. Um, but I would tell you that conventional venogram, where's, where's the problem with conventional venogram? If you do a regular venogram, do you miss anything on, uh, on narrowing of the iliac vein? Can you see it? So the biggest problem is you get pancaking. You can see on a regular venogram, it's an AP view. So the vessel can be collapse like this, and it's a long, flat vessel, but on a venogram, it'll look totally normal. So you really need IVIS to show you the three-dimensional, or at least the circumferential diameter of the vein. So I think IVIS is really important. I use it all the time. I actually try never to do a CT. I do a venogram almost always when I do an IVIS, but I try never just do a CT, because I think the CT can be misleading, and sometimes you miss disease in different locations. Um, so before I get to that, I will tell you also that I think there are a lot of people who treat venous disease from the popliteal, and similar to John I, I treat it now from the superficial femoral vein, and the technique for that is to find the lesser trochanter on x-ray, and you can also find the superficial femoral vein on ultrasound, and it's below the inguinal crease, obviously, because that's where the femoral vein is, a little bit above the inguinal ligament, but you generally will be about, I don't know, maybe eight centimeters distal to the common femoral vein. And you'll see the vein, the vein will, you'll see the superficial femoral vein, and the superficial femoral artery will sit right on top of it. And when it shifts a little bit, that's where you can get your needle in. You need to be good at ultrasound-guided um, access to those procedures. But the advantage to getting into the superficial femoral vein is, one, if there's sometimes, sometimes people have had treatment of May Turner and they still have swelling, and sometimes they have actually disease that progresses below the inguinal ligament. Unlike arterial disease, it is very acceptable and sometimes indicated to treat beyond the inguinal ligament because you get femoral vein stenosis. So it allows you to treat more distally if you puncture the superficial femoral vein. But also, you know, I've had patients who had a lymph node that was compressing the vein, and if the lymph node is compressing the vein, you won't see that if you puncture too high. So you want to puncture low, and it takes a little bit of, uh, like I generally have my patients prepped in a frog-like position because it's a little bit more medial. And else it's deep. That vein can be about three or four centimeters deep. Depending on the patient in Texas, it could be six centimeters deep. It is harder to puncture at a six centimeter level. But it's useful if you can puncture a little bit further down instead of puncturing directly in the femoral vein. So I would really recommend that technique. Um, 
So I want you to consider iliac vein stenosis. So I started looking at all my patients, and you know, it, I had all these patients who came to me with leg swelling, different problems, and so these are the, really the things I think you should think about. If a patient has lymphedema, and I'll go through that, the guru of all things vein in the world is this guy Raju in Mississippi, and he presented some very, very nice data at American Venus Forum. And so if you have a patient with lymphedema, what is your treatment for lymphedema? Somebody tell me. Compression. Now, what if, you, what if you found that that patient actually had an iliac vein problem and you treated them and they got better? So although I think lymphedema is lymphedema, if, if even 10% of my patients with lymphedema didn't have to wear chronic compression, that would be a home run. So I have a very low threshold for patients with lymphedema to at least rule out a proximal iliac vein obstructive problem. If patients have unilateral leg swelling, you know, I do their duplex study, they come in, they've got some varicose veins, there's some leg swelling, and I look at their saphenous vein, and, you know, look, their reflex time is 2,000 on one leg and 2,000 on the other leg, but gosh, that, that right leg is really swollen compared to the left leg. You know, that doesn't really make clinical sense if their reflex times are the same on both sides, but they've got really significant swelling on one side versus the other. I have a low threshold for looking to see if they have a proximal venous obstructive disease in that population. If they have had a prior DVT, you, plaid shirt, I'm just going to pick on you today. Um, I'll pick on somebody else too. But uh, if someone has a deep vein, deep vein thrombosis study, where does the ultrasound start on a deep vein thrombosis? What's the most proximal part that they image? I think it's femoral. Yeah, femoral or distal external iliac, right? So I've had people who come in the hospital and they have leg swelling and I have the in internist call me like, they have leg swelling and I'd swear they're a deep vein thrombosis but their ultrasound was normal. That can happen. That can happen because you can have an iliac vein thrombus that isn't noted on ultrasound. And everybody gets the study and goes, well, it's normal. It's not normal, they just didn't get, in that case, I would do a CT with a delayed phase contrast. Really, the best way to get that is to do an aortic study with delayed imaging, like stent graft protocol, because they'll do the second pass and they'll see the venous phase with contrast. But anyway, I mean, so for patients with prior DVT history, Sometimes even if they have resolution of their femoral vein thrombus, they still have iliac vein thrombus. So you really always have to think that there might have been an unrecognized DVT. Um, patients with a previous IVC filter, we know that filters, filters are bad. We'll just say it now. They save some lives, but now over time, we now think filters are bad. It's kind of like frontal lobotomy for schizophrenia. It was kind of abandoned. I think that's going to happen with IVC filters. So uh, people with prior pelvic trauma, prior pelvic trauma, uh, those patients have a very, very high risk of a venous injury or inflammation that was an unrecognized DVT or an unrecognized stenosis of the vein. And then uh, people with recalcitrant leg ulcers. You know, I have all these people who have come to me for ulcers and I do an amazing job treating their superficial vein and then they get better and then six months later they come back and I look and I see, okay, there's maybe one small perforator I could fix, but is that really their problem? So, and then uh, lastly, patients with pelvic venous congestion syndrome. Patients with pelvic vein congestion syndrome where they have labial varicosities or they have dyspareunia, you have to think that they might have obstructive problems instead of a reflex problem. So all of those patients are people to consider for iliac vein stenosis. So I'm just gonna go through a few cases. Um, it's not a complex thing, but you should really, really always think about whether or not there's a proximal problem. And I really, in my practice, it's evolved where now I'm like nihilistic about, do they have a proximal problem when they come in? Because if I can fix that, then sometimes the other stuff doesn't even matter. So um, Raju at the American Venus Forum talked about the diagnosis of classic lymphedema. So classic lymphedema, right, anybody with swelling on the dorsum of their foot, anybody with these little sort of Vienna sausage-like toes, those are patients with classic lymphedema. So if someone comes to my clinic with swelling of the dorsum of their foot, the first thing I tell them is you probably have lymphedema, you probably have some venous disease that goes along with your lymphedema, I might not make you better, but I'm going to see if there's anything I can do from a venous standpoint to help you. But anyway, he did 769 lymphocentigraphies, about half were abnormal, half were normal. See the swelling on the top of the foot? Those patients have lymphedema and will prove it otherwise. But anyway, he basically found that 34% of those patients had iliac vein stenosis, and some got substantially better when he treated their iliac veins. So in my practice, if 30% of my lymphedema patients could get better, I think that is a win for a lymphedema patient because chronic compression is hard to do. It's hard to get patients on board with that. So uh, pelvic venous insufficiency, also at the American Venus Forum, this was presented, and there were 227 women with pelvic vein congestion syndrome, and about 80% of those people had uh, iliac vein stenosis, not pelvic reflex, not gonadal vein reflex, but stenosis on IVUS. So you should always consider obstructive disease when it comes to IVUS. IVC filters, I think we all are aware of the fact that IVC filters are bad. 
Um, so IVC filters have a 1 to 33 percent incidence of venous thrombosis associated with them. And I think we've all seen these patients who came in who we had to take them out and they had this chronic obstruction not only of the filter but sometimes of the iliac veins further down. And the removal of filter occlusion rate is at least 8 percent and probably higher than that. We just don't see all those patients. So anybody who might have had a previous filter should be considered for that. This is a patient of mine who had pelvic vein trauma. So he came in and he had right leg swelling. He had ultrasounds that showed basically superficial uh, reflux in the great saphenous vein bilaterally. And I was like, well, wait a minute, maybe. Why is your right leg so much more swollen? So sure enough, this was his x-ray. You can imagine that if he had a big screw and he had pelvic vein trauma, that there probably was some scarring of the vein. This isn't as dramatic on venogram. On ultrasound, it was really dramatic. And we stitted him and he got better. So um, I have another case example of a 59-year-old male. This was a guy who is really a hardworking guy. He works a night shift in a chemical plant. He's on his feet all night long. He wears a ferro wrap, which for those of you who don't know that, that's the one with Velcro on it. So he's, and he's a really compliant patient. He's been on warfarin his whole life. And he kind of has this great esprit. But uh, we treated his superficial veins, and his ulcer got a little bit better. And then uh, he came back about eight months later, and he had a recurrent ulcer. So we treated his veins, and it turns out that he had, he had right-sided iliac vein occlusion, and we were able to open that up. And I can tell you, he came into my clinic four days later, no ferro wrap, no leg swelling, better. I mean, and it was like Lazarus walking on water, right? He, or Lazarus rising from the stretcher. He just was so much happier that he, he didn't have the swelling. So he still had the ulcer, so I made him keep wearing the compression, but that was pretty dramatic. So if you can open up an iliac vein, uh, this is that same case where he had an iliac vein stenosis and we treated it and it had to rethink the problem, right? Initially the problem was he has superficial vein disease and we treat it and his ulcer will get better. Then I rethought the problem, we treated this focal stenosis. This is actually after we actually angioplasty it, it was completely occluded. This is wide open and you can see if this was completely occluded, this is our post angioplasty result uh, before we stented it he was dramatically better, and he was eternally grateful. And even the dermatologist that had been seen him was like, can you do that for everybody? And I was like, I don't know, but we can try. So uh, he was a very dramatic example. I had another case of a patient who was a former Navy SEAL. You know, the problem is these people get recurrent stenosis, not only the one DVT, but then they have an outflow blockage, so they continue to get more DVTs. So they're like, oh, I just keep getting DVTs. So this guy was a Navy SEAL. He had an IVC filter. He had multiple recurrent DVTs and PEs. Um, this was his initial venogram. You can see that the vein contrast goes up a little bit. You can't really see it very well. It doesn't project that well. On the left side, there was really no flow. This is our venogram from the left side. This is completely blocked. This is his filter. This is a hard filter to take out. Uh, over time, it is being done more and more, but it's hard to take that out. This was after we ballooned it a little bit. We got our wires through the filter. There's lots of little tricks to getting through the filter. Um, this was our completion result. So do you think he was better? He was better. Um, Ilia vein stents have a high patency rate. There's this primary patency rate, which is 67% at about five years. It's 90% with assistance. So pretty high long-term patency rate, but they do need to be monitored with ultrasound. Um, it is effective, just briefly. There are some failure rates with the wall stent, and the biggest criticism is coning. If you don't get well enough above the blockage, the stent can infold a little bit, and then you get some flow limitations. So there are new stents coming out. Um, and then also the other limitation, which is why, if I show you this, when you're looking with ultrasound, I try to puncture at the lesser trochanter. This is in the femoral vein. It is sometimes deep, but if you can puncture there, then you can treat across this iliac uh, inguinal ligament, and it, sometimes this is the area of stenosis that has to be treated. So sometimes that's where the failure rate is. There are new venous stents coming out that should be superior for iliac vein disease. I would encourage you, especially if you have an outpatient practice where you see superficial vein disease, that you need to rethink the equation if your superficial vein treatment doesn't give them the result. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for iliac vein treatment to make a lot of people better. I think it's very under-recognized. Thank you.